Hello and welcome to Michigan Gardener. It's May and right above me on a wire is a cardinal so you'll probably hear him piping off a little bit. So this is the vegetable garden but we're wanting to plant a bunch of flowers all around it and even in there with the vegetables to help attract pollinators. So that's been a big uh, project so far this year. And for the entrance to the garden, uh, I built a pergola from a kit and uh, we're gonna sink in th this post and this post. Now, these are basically just two by fours and they are only as long as right to the ground. So in order to sink those and anchor them in cement, I went to Lowe's and I got some of these uh, four by four rescue things. Uh, and the idea is, is if you have a four by four where the end is busted up, you can screw those in and still have that be an anchor for you. Uh, I really couldn't find a better solution to being able to um, secure this in cement other than to dig post holes and then to um, attach these uh, four by four rescue posts and we should have uh, really good stability even with just two concrete anchor points. May 1st <laughs> and snowing. This is why we have to wait as much as we hate to. And now uh, we add about a gallon of water to each one of these holes. Um, at least that's what the destructions say. This is a two gallon watering can, so I'll put about half in there. That means that right now is a perfect time to go to the garden center and see if they have my rose for this. All right, we are, ve we are very excited because we returned from the garden center with two of the exact climbing roses that we were hoping to find. Um, this is Rosa New Dawn. Rosa New Dawn is um, one of the most popular climbers. It should have pretty vigorous growth here in full sun. It is a pale pink, um, very light colored, uh, profusely blooming climbing rose. Um, it should repeat bloom as long as we deadhead it and it should be very at home on this trellis. We're working on getting more pollinators into this vegetable garden so we are in the beginning stages of planting a cottage garden around the perimeter and this rose should attract bees. It, it does have um, petals that they should be easy they should easily be able to climb inside and pollinate. All right, so I've dug a hole big enough for the pot and we're gonna angle it toward the trellis. We're gonna add a little bit of dairy dew to enrich in this soil. It does have quite a bit of clay, but it's also kind of sandy, so it's well draining already. I'm gonna skip the grit, but I am not gonna skip the mic. We'll go ahead and put some of the mic um, tree and shrub on here to help get the roots acclimated to the soil to take up water. In order to be effective, the mic has to be in contact with the roots on the plant that you're planting. So you want to make sure you put it directly on the root ball plus a little bit at the bottom of the hole that you've dug. We're also going to add in some dairy dew or any other kind of compost will work pretty well, um, but we want to give it a very rich beginning. One thing that Gretchen didn't tell you about Rosa New Dawn is that in 1993, it won the Royal Horticultural Society's Award of Garden Merit. And so if you don't know what that is, uh, every year all the plants get together and have a big competition. It's like a dance competition only for plants and they just go nuts like 
the plants are highly competitive and only the best of the best get an award of garden merit. And it means that it's probably gonna grow well and you'll be happy with it. Also in 1997, Rosa New Dawn was awarded the World Federation of Rose Society's World's Favorite Rose. So it's a good one. Uh, we're, we're hoping for great things. Now on to my favorite part of gardening is vegetables and this is a tomato plant that I bought. It's mortgage lifter but this one is different from your regular tomatoes in that it's been grafted. So what a, a grafted tomato plant is, is they take a rootstock that's really disease resistant and really, really strong. And uh, maybe it doesn't make the best tomatoes in the world, but it, like, the tomato plant is gonna basically be disease free if you have that. Um, and then now Mortgage Lifter is a heirloom variety that they've grafted on top of it. So uh, heirloom varieties, um, sometimes they're an heirloom variety and not commonly grown for a reason. Uh, like for instance, my old German, which is by far my favorite tomato I've ever had. Um, that's an heirloom variety, but I planted uh, probably 30 different seeds from three different seed companies and I got total maybe 10 plants out of that. So the germination rate is low uh, and they seem to be a little bit slower to start than the other rows or the other tomatoes that I planted. So for these uh, grafted tomatoes, uh, you plant these a little bit differently than you would uh, a regular tomato plant, and, and I'll explain that later uh, as we're planting our other tomatoes. But for these, you, you want the graft to be uh, above the graft point up above the soil, and the graft point is right here. So if we just plant this level with the soil, we should be okay. Um, you don't want the grafted plant or the scion um, to have stem underground or what can happen is it'll produce uh, roots and then that'll screw up the, you no longer have a, a true grafted um, thing. You're, you're dealing with the native plant's roots as well. Um, I've always kind of wanted to try Mortgage Lifter. It's got kind of a neat story. Uh, the guy that hybridized it and came up with it was a uh, gardener and he, he sold so many of them that he uh, called it mortgage lifter because he was able to pay off his house. So we'll see if we like the performance of this variety this year. Wasn't planning on doing it, but I did see these at the, at the store. And it's one of those things that I had a hard time resisting. This next variety I'm gonna plant is called Rutgers 250. And I have to say, I'm extremely excited to see how these do. Now the Rutgers tomato was uh, in the 19, late 1930s, was a hybrid created by Rutgers University for Campbell's uh, between two different varieties. I think one was Marglobe and the other was um, I can't remember some some sort of a proprietary variety that uh, Campbell's was already using. And during the 1960s, uh, that variety kind of went out of favor because they switched from hand picking tomatoes to machine picking them and they needed a variety that was tolerant of that sort of thing. Now, with, with a regular tomato plant that hasn't been root grafted, you want to plant that um, fairly deep. Monty Don says up to the first root, but, or up to the first leaf, but in this case, the first leaves were the cotyledon leaves, and those have already fallen off. So uh, that's what we're going to do. I think I will plant eight of these and uh, we'll see how, see how they do in our garden. Um, basically, that variety was lost to time because Rutgers stopped making the seeds and, and give, making them available to people, and so, uh, the, you know, you, you couldn't get them anymore. 
Well, on the 250th anniversary of Rutgers University, they decided to do something special and recreate that hybrid. Um, people that had the original tomatoes uh, just loved them. I mean, it was literally one of the best tomatoes anybody ever ate. And uh, so, you know, once it went away, people always wanted them. Well, and of course, some people kept seeds alive in, the, in their garden and in their family, but by the time 50 years has gone by, it's not like, it's not like Rutgers tomatoes will only screw another Rutgers tomato. So after 50 years, what you're left with is probably a hybrid of a bunch of different things. So these are the original cross, uh, and you can get seeds for these from Roar Seeds. Uh, Rutgers sold them for a couple years, but then passed that uh, portion of it along to Roarer Seeds. Um, and that's where these came from. All right, next variety is Old German. Last year, this was my favorite, all-time favorite tomato. Um, I will say though that even with seeds from different companies, planted 30 seeds and I got one, two, three, four, five seedlings and only one of these looks super strong. So um, maybe better to buy established plants with these. I don't know, we'll see how these do. Um, hopefully we'll be eating these glorious tomatoes in a little bit. Um, with any any of these tomatoes, um, if we have problems along the way with with one, one of them dies or something, we'll dig it out and we'll we'll replant. Um, but hopefully, we'll get some. This one looks pretty healthy. Had nice healthy roots. Again, planting it a little deep. What that does is it stabilizes the plant a little bit, but then it um, leaves, or if roots grow out from the stem, so you'll get a bigger eventual root ball from the same plant. All right, we're ready to plant up our sweet peas. These are a blend. Um, you wanna plant them on the inside of your tripod support. They will need a little bit of tying in until they get up a little ways onto the support and then they will tendril their way up on their own. They're a little bit of a greedy plant so I put some compost in the bottom of these holes and we planted these March 1st, three seeds to a solo cup and we're just gonna plant the whole cup trying not to disturb any of the roots. As you can see, this plant has a really healthy root system. Planting them on the inside of the tripod makes it much easier to maintain the plant with weeding and watering. The next variety I'll be planting is purple Cherokee. This one comes highly recommended by a lot of old timers uh, that tell me about they tomatoes. Uh, we'll see, I'll be the judge, but um, I planted 12 seeds and I got five really robust healthy looking seedlings. Um, the dog got into <laughs> part of the tray and so some of it lived and some of it didn't but we'll have at least five plants this year. These ones I am going to plant pretty deep. Um, it seems like when when these were rooting they partially pushed themselves out of the the soil so we'll want to get as much stem in the ground as we can here. Um, they're really clinging to the inside of the pot, so there is a good root ball there. It's just um, needs some stem support. Next I'll be planting uh, Ananas Noir. This is a variety I heard about from Gardener's World and it's uh, kind of a red and white and it's got some green coloration to it as well. And uh, I don't know, I've never planted it. I don't know anyone who has, but uh, 
I thought I'd give it a try because they looked so good on TV. <laughs> Next I'll be planting a variety called Black Sea Man. I don't know much about the variety. I think these were gift seeds, um, but I planted 11 seeds and I got re 11 really super healthy seedlings out of it. I'm impressed with how good these look relative to the other tomato plants. The last variety for the year is something called Rampopo, and <laughs> I know nothing about it. I think this is another one of those gift packets of seeds I got. Um, turns out if you buy a lot of seed and things, companies a lot of times will send you like extras of stuff. And um, these ones like grew great plants. I planted 12 and got 12 seedlings. All right, I'm planting the last of four zucchini. We're gonna try and get them to grow up this tripod, but it may require some tying in. Um, zucchini are a very hungry plant, so you want to make sure that the soil is very rich and that they get plenty of water. I've amended this soil a little bit with some veggie dew compost. You can use whatever you use. The last thing I'll be planting this uh, today is a really neat crop. Um, this here is something called a handy panel, which is available from like farm and fleet stores and things like that. And it's a really good trellis for what I'm about to grow. And to grow it, we're just gonna make a nice trench along the base of this here. Might have to make a couple passes. The soil's a little rocky. And it's a good thing this is the last thing we're planting because it's starting to rain. Um, these are called Christmas lima beans, and the reason I found out about those is if you watched the March episode, you saw the oak savanna. If you haven't seen that, you should watch it. It's really good. Um, but he, I was talking to him about um, Anasazi beans, which is another thing I'm going to plant this year, and he brought out something called Christmas lima beans, and it's a a bean, it's not the gross ones that your mom forced you to eat when you were a kid, like those green nasty ones. Uh, these, you eat, you, you dry them, you let them dry in the pod, and then you can go and uh, uh, harvest them, and then you cook those beans with a ham hock. So they're really, really good. Um, and they're red and white speckled, and, and so are the uh, Anasazi beans that I was telling them about. So here's my bag of beans they, they gave me, and he said to just plant them every few inches uh, in a little trench like this, and let them grow up the handy panel, and every, every time he's ever done it, he's had more beans than he could eat. Uh, Gretchen's gonna help by reburying those, and we'll give them a, a good watering. Hi, we're out here at the vegetable garden, and so far everything is going great with the deer fence. However, we have some um, sweet peas planted here outside of the deer fence, which are designed to bring pollinators into the veg garden. Unfortunately, some rabbits have been eating the sweet peas. So we felt, Kyle and I, that the most humane solution would be to get some rabbit repellent. And you just apply this in a circle around your bed and it should, in theory, keep the rabbits out. It's time to give an update on the pawpaw garden. So last year, I planted two pawpaw trees there and there in their circle and surrounded them with some lavender. Then I have this rectangular area in the middle. And last fall, I planted uh, Indian paintbrush seeds, uh, which are, believe it or not, native to Michigan, uh, but none of them took. And I also planted some Texas blue bonnets, which is a type of lupine, which should, in theory, grow here, and none of those took. So uh, I have 
some trials going with seeds from those plants in the basement. Um, but in the meantime, I've, we've taken and uh, planted a close relative of those plants, Spigelia, and we'll have these and then hopefully over time establish some uh, blue bonnets and uh, actual um, Indian paintbrush in here, but it, it's, it's going to be a project, I think. When I planted these pawpaw trees, I took great care to protect them from deer. The main danger um, that a pawpaw tree is supposed to have when it's young like this is from deer um, brushing their antlers along the trunk. So I put some plastic tubing to protect the trunk and I also put a big stake in here. And the stake is when they put their head in there, they'll bang against it and they won't like it. Uh, so the pawpaw tree is Asamina triloba. Asamina comes from the Algonquin word meaning fruit, and triloba comes from the fact that these form a purple three-lobed flower in the spring before you get your fruit. Um, these are supposed to be extremely poisonous to deer, and they're not supposed to want anything to do with them. However, as you can see, uh, some deer nibbled a few of the end branches here. Um, so this is not a clean cut, and what I want to do is protect this from um, fungal infections and things by bringing that cut back to just above a leaf. And there are some other branches in here that got browsed or uh, grazed, and I'll take care of those as well. Something happened this year that I was definitely not expecting, and that's that both of these trees have formed little flower buds, and they haven't opened yet, um, but when they do, uh, we'll get some close-ups of the flowers and things. Um, if you want pawpaw fruits, you have to have two trees, and both of these trees are flowering. There's less flowers on that one, um, but hopefully we'll get some pawpaw fruits this year. Sadly, when the tulips came up this year, the deer came along and ate all of them, uh, with the exception of a few here and there. Uh, we are, they're still growing, and some of them are still blooming. Um, so we'll see how this works out. Um, if nothing else, they'll put the energy from the uh, leaves back into the bulbs. And next spring, I'll just put a little electric fence around this temporarily until the tulips get up and established. These two plants here and here are what are called uh, Dracula plants or Dracula lily. I planted five of these last year and two have come up. I don't know if they flower in their first year or if they have to be in place for a while. Uh, we just have to kind of wait and see what happens. Um, the funny thing is, is that when these came up, I knew they were not something I'd seen before and I put it in a plant app to identify it and it said it was Jack in the pulpit but it's not this is uh, the very early form of um, uh, Draculanus vulgaris um, they have a kind of a spotty brownish stem that comes up first with a couple leaves on top and we'll watch these as the foliage develops throughout the spring and hopefully we'll see a flowering well the first five seedlings of my um, Texas blue bonnets have come up and they've got true leaves on them now so it's time to uh, pot them on into a little bit bigger container each one of them have their own space so we know a few things about the soil that these grow in it's crappy soil meaning it's not like super duper you know rich like Iowa dirt um, it's like Texas and it's got sand and other stuff in it too but it's you don't have to go crazy like giving these things like ultra premium potting compost or anything like that 
Um, the other thing I know from sad experience with lupines is they really like um, good drainage. So uh, this potting compost that I'm using here is just kind of a general purpose one. It's not too rich, but it's got um, quite a bit of, um, looks like, uh, it's probably perlite uh, in there to help with drainage. And then um, I added some uh, grit as well. So to, to do this, we just put a, a little knife underneath it to see if we can get all of the roots out and then never grab it by the stem, always grab it by a leaf. And so I'm grabbing by what's called a cotyledon, which is the, the bottom um, leaf uh, on a plant. And wow, they, they already had great roots going. So that's good. Um, I think these are gonna be nice, strong little seedlings. And we'll just uh, kind of put a little bit of this in there. Make sure it's gonna like its new home. And we'll do that with the other five. And then I've got another planting project to do. If you saw April's show, <clears throat> you learned a little bit about prairies and two dominant types of prairie grass, one being uh, big blue stem and the other being little blue stem. Um, and I got an idea from our prairie and oak savanna guy about making little pots of each uh, so that you can get a good healthy established grass and then just kind of plunking it down um, here and there in borders to make uh, like a wildflower border. Um, so I have some uh, big blue st seed stem here and the what we do is we have to sow it. Um, so I have these pots labeled big and little uh, so we don't mix them up, although it's pretty hard to mistake, but I guess, I don't know. Stranger things have happened. So um, what we'll do is for each of these pots, scatter you know some of the seed around it doesn't have to be a whole lot and then just press it down make sure it's in firm contact with the soil we'll do that for each of these and I'm just gonna scatter just a little bit of um, soil over the top just so that things don't wash away and so that eager birds don't get to have their way with my seeds I'm very excited because the raspberries are looking great. A few months ago, we had some turf removed and the really nice guy who does our lawn and he does a great job, ran over half of the strawberries with an end loader and scraped them, or the, the raspberries, I'm sorry. But they have come back. Raspberries are resilient. They do need a little bit of care though. Raspberries will do a lot of the work for you, but they need a few little helpers. First of all, you wanna make sure that you have a nice strong row of plants and you wanna dig out any of these little suckers that are off to the side because what they're gonna do is they're gonna sap the overall raspberry patch's energy. Raspberries also benefit from staking. We have, Kyle has dug a, um, a deep post hole on either end of the raspberry, um, the raspberry row, and we are going to sink some heavy duty fence posts in and attach wire that we can then tie in, that we can then tie in each of the raspberry canes. I don't know what happened to Louise, but uh, nature polices its own. 
All right, I've added some nasturtiums to the zucchini tripod or um, the, the zucchini tower and also to the cucumber tower. I planted cucumbers in the same way that I planted the zucchini, one on the inside of each uh, pole. And then I planted some nasturtiums that can also be trained to climb up the tripods or they can also sprawl on the ground. They're a great companion plant. They not only keep some pests away, um, but you can also eat both the flowers and the leaves and I'm told they have kind of a radishy flavor. Today I cultivated kind of the mid portion of the garden and my goal today is to plant uh, some corn uh, but I'm planting some companion plants. Uh, so if you don't know, um, in the Americas corn is native and a bunch of other things are and dating back to pretty much ancient times, uh, the native people that lived here planted uh, corn along with companion plants. The, the system is called the Three Sisters, and it involves planting corn and then beans next to the corn so that they have something to climb, and then uh, squashes. So what happens is the corn grows and the beans uh, put nitrogen into the soil helping the corn, and then uh, they also have something to climb up. And what the squashes do is, again, provide additional food, but um, they can provide a little bit of cover on the ground once they get going enough, and that uh, helps keep weeds down and things like that. I've chosen a variety called butter gold for the corn. And the thing you have to remember about corn is it's wind pollinated. So that you have to uh, plant it in kind of a grid. And so I'm just gonna make a little drill here with my uh, hoe. And then I'll put a seed every 12 inches in here uh, with the idea of next to them planting another row of beans. And I'll show that. So we'll start by every foot or so, we'll put a little piece of corn. And that's a foot. The next thing to do is to just cover these over. You don't want them buried too deeply. Um, one to two inches is more than enough, uh, according to our directions. Um, so there's all kinds of origin stories about these beans. Um, and kind of the one that you'll probably read the most about is that some archeologist was in a cave and he like found some samples of beans in a pot and grew them and then it was like the Anasazi. So I'm just gonna kind of firm it in just a little bit. Well, that sounds like a very, very clever and well orchestrated marketing scheme. Um, not that I blame them, <laughs> like, it, but it's almost too perfect. And uh, I'll let you decide for yourself. Um, but anyway. But the beans themselves, they're like a, um, they're like a pinto bean, and that's, that's what they're flavored like. Um, and uh, they, they have just a little bit different flavor than a typical pinto. Now, at least until these get going, I'm gonna wanna be able to uh, get in here with a cultivator in between the rows. So I'm spacing my rows uh, so that I can get my cultivator in between them. And typically the spacing is supposed to be about two feet anyway, so that makes sense. So um, we'll do another drill this way. And that's where our next corn will go. And we'll keep doing this with, uh, with uh, drills and, and uh, two drills next to each other for corn and beans until we get a pretty good sized crop in. In between the rows, this is where I'm gonna put our squashes. 
and I have a bunch of different ones to choose from. I planted uh, in March, I planted some uh, pumpkins, so pie pumpkins. I planted uh, butternut squash, I planted jack-o'-lanterns, and I planted this other one called Turk's Turban. And I'm pretty excited about these. I'm hoping that we end up with some tasty crops. But just kind of in the center of each of these rows, I'm going to put uh, some of our plants. And then as, uh, as I run out of space, then I'll come back and dot some more in here and there. But for right now, I'm just going to do a row and put a put a squash in right smack in the center of it. And this one's really well grown into that pot. And it's pretty wet. Um, there we go. And we'll just put some soil around the base there. All right, I'm planting up the final structure with loofah gourds. Last year, we planted loofah gourds. We had four of them, and it was a very disappointing harvest. We only got one gourd. And Kyle actually sleuthed out why. Loofah gourds produce both a male and a female flower, and they are pollinated at night by moths. Um, unfortunately, ants will come along and eat the male flower, which is no good. Last year, we knew something was eating the flowers, but we did not know what, so we put a net over the top, which then prevented moths, probably, from pollinating our plants. So we're gonna give it a try again. Um, we got the idea to grow loofahs on our favorite gardening program, Gardener's World. Our idol, Monty Don, grew loofahs and he had kind of moderate success as well. Um, loofahs are those little sponges that you can buy in the beauty aisle at the grocery store. You harvest the gourd, let it dry out, and then you can make all kinds of little um, kitchen scrubbies, bathroom scrubbies out of them. So it should be fun. We're going to give it a go again. Well, the garden's really taking shape. Um, these white things in the ground mark some rows. I'll tell you what I'm going to plant there. And then directly behind me are 30 different pepper plants that we started in March. They're pretty darn small. Uh, and then directly behind that is our corn and beans and squashes. And over there, I put in uh, some uh, uh, cantaloupe and some watermelon just to try it. Homegrown cantaloupe is amazing. Um, I think I've grown watermelons one other time, but I, I don't remember much about it, but I remember it being tasty. Uh, and then the other thing we've done in the interim is sink posts for the uh, next thing, which is gonna be to stake out the raspberries. Now, in these rows, I'm gonna plant some edamame seeds from Japan. And if you don't know what edamame is, it's basically just soybeans that they like boil briefly in salt water and you eat them up and they're really good. Our family really loves teppanyaki. Uh, so, you know, we, we get that quite frequently and edamame is definitely on the menu. Uh, but for these, you wanna plant them uh, in rows six to 10 inches apart. Uh, so the seedlings will go in here, one every six inches or so. And then uh, I'll decide how many seeds left I have left and maybe put in some additional rows of it in between here. Now, this works really well because uh, the beans are a nitrogen fixer and next year this is where I'm gonna have to put the tomatoes in this spot right here. So we'll wanna get this as nitrogen rich as possible. I want to introduce you to a plant called an allium. An allium is an early spring bloomer. It's a member of the onion family and you plant it as a bulb. It will also seed itself. Um, you usually leave the blooms on the plant and they dry and they make kind of an attractive um, 
attractive seed heads. Some people use them um, dried for Christmas decorations. Um, they're especially beautiful planted in and amongst other plants that have more billowy leaves like a hosta, or in this case we have it in with some ligularia. Um, they do multiply kind of profusely if they're planted in the right situation. Over here, we have a chive that we planted last year and uh, we just left it on the table. We kind of forgot about it over winter and uh, it survived the winter in a pot and this spring we just cut some of the dead off and it has flowered again. So chives are also a member uh, or a relative of an onion and um, it's kind of an nice surprise to have something blooming for you that you didn't necessarily have to do a lot of work for. This fine specimen of a plant is Phytolaca americana. Now if you remember, that's pokeweed. The phyto meaning uh, plant, laca meaning crimson, and I'll show how the, the stem is actually kind of crimson and it'll grow that way more as the year progresses. And americana is American, so this is pokeweed. And you remember uh, that song, uh, Poke Salad Annie, and it's S-A-L-A-T, not salad, it's salad. Um, anyway, this is the plant that inspired that. And we did a segment on this last year, and I'm going to follow this plant throughout the year to show you the great various uh, stages of growth that it goes through to make uh, identifying a little bit easier. It's got these... Uh, really at this point very soft, uh, very tender uh, leaves and the stem is kind of crimson, uh, especially more towards the base. And this is poisonous as hell, uh, even right now. But what you can do, if you are so inclined, is you can harvest the leaves at this stage, boil them three separate times, changing out the water in between, and you can have uh, poke salad. And it's basically like collard greens or turnip greens, but it ain't. Uh, and it's very, very high in vitamins and nutrients, and it's basically a free, uh, free, super good vitamin source uh, if you are living in an area that has this and not a lot of other food opportunities for vitamins. So that's why um, this plant is particularly revered. And I, when I lived in Kentucky, I heard about people who had generations long family feuds because somebody found the other one's poke salad patch and raided it and Anyway, one thing led to another, Hatfields and McCoys. You get the picture. Anyway, so what I plan to do this year is follow this one plant so that you can see it throughout its life cycle. This is uh, one day before Memorial Day, so end of May. Uh, and we'll watch this throughout the year and we'll see every single stage of its life. Interestingly, this has a very long taproot. They can get eight to 10 feet tall once that taproot is established and they come back every year in the same spot. So where to look for these, at least where I live, and I, right now I can see 10 more, is kind of on the edge of the woods in dappled shades. Uh, you also see them, uh, a lot of times there'll be a pine tree in the middle of a yard and there'll be a lot of this underneath it. Uh, and I think it's because the birdies and things come along and in the fall those little berries, those little poke berries that would kill the shit out of you and everyone you know if you took one and mixed it into like a lemonade or something and gave everybody a cup. We're talking like Jonestown here is how poisonous that is. Well birds don't have a problem with it and they eat it and they poop the seeds. Well where do they perch? On the edge of woods, underneath pine trees and things and so you'll see them growing in this dappled shade where there's not too much undergrowth and uh, anyway there it's literally every once you know what to look for you see it everywhere well that's all we have for the may michigan gardener we hope you're enjoying your garden as much as we are and that your garden is shaping up just like ours